psychologist too right away that had me talking about it after I found out that those guys passed away. I didn't want to talk to anybody, and he's like, "Well, if you just talk to me, and you don't have to talk to anybody else." And I was like, "All right." So I said, kind of what had what was going through my mind, and then more stuff flowed out, more stuff flowed out, mm -hmm. and I felt better. And uh, after I did that, I continued to talk talk about the story and tell a little bit more and more of what happened or, or stuff. And that now I can talk about it pretty easily, like even if I'm out and about at a bar or something like that, or, or just at a CrossFit gym meeting new people, I don't, I'm not one of those people that's like, ah, no, no, I don't want to bring that up, you know, uh, pretty open about it. Uh, not, not that I'm knocking the people that are like that, everybody has their own demons, their own struggles, um, and not everybody can get moved past it, but I was fortunate enough to, uh, to piece myself up back together, and it doesn't affect me too, too bad, for the most part. Uh, she deals with some of my <coughs> and stuff like that. Um, sometimes I'll wake her up and everything. That's more of my thing. I have the I have nightmares. It's gonna go somewhere, you know. If I'm not walking around like a crazy person, always winging out. Then that's probably where it goes to. But really, she beats me up more at night than anything. She's the one that kicks a lot. So um, yeah. Um, does that answer that? One? Yeah. Right, thank cool. you. Um, you talked about the vision and the hearing loss. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how you have to adapt your world to for that? Yeah, uh, the hearing loss is the biggest pain, probably, with, with the vision. Um, I, can, uh, I can legally drive during the day right now. Um, it's good enough for that, although I, it's hit or miss on whether it's going to stay there because it was like a very fine line. I'm like, legally good enough to drive during the day? I like that much. So uh, we'll see where that goes. Hopefully it gets a little better. Um, my right eye is pretty much completely blind. That was really funny too. When the doctor was doing the test, he's holding the chart. And I was like, no, I can't see that. So he moved the chart closer. No, I can't see that. So he put up fingers and then got closer. Like, no, I still can't see it. He was literally like right here in front of my face. I was like, I think it's two. When it was just my right eye. He goes, good enough, 2,500. Like, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, um, the adaptations that I need to make uh, for that, I have a magnifying glass that I need to bring out more. Uh, that was one of the more helpful things. My left eye has a central blind spot uh, where the retina started to detach in the middle. Uh, unfortunately, when that's caused by trauma, not a good chance to fix it. So like in, a, in an elderly person where their retina starts to detach, usually they'll drain out the eyeball and fill it up with gas and reattach. Uh, and they have really good Really good luck with that, but uh, not so much with the trauma patients, at least not yet. Um, so that can be a real pain. Reading, reading really stinks for me. Uh, I have a computer now that I can blow some things up, and on my, I have the iPhone. I, that's why I got a smartphone so that I could, because I really hate smartphones and all the technology stuff. I'd rather just stick to like a Nokia or something, but <laughs> I can't read text messages and stuff like that. So. Um, so that helps out a lot with the technology part. As far as just reading day-to-day -day stuff, magnifying glass, that's really it. Old school, I just whip one out and start messing with that. People look at me like I'm crazy, but it gets the job done. Uh, I don't drive at night. I'm not supposed to. So I say that I don't drive at night every now and then I will. But I just go really slow, just to like a little place down the street from me. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I ask a lot more questions now. You know, I'm not, I've never really been afraid to, but it can, I can see where it would be embarrassing for somebody, because uh, there's been a few times that I've been embarrassed myself, like at a McDonald's, and I'm like, hey, what's that new sandwich there? They're like, just read the sign, dude. And they'd be like, yeah, if it was that easy, I wouldn't ask you the same question. But, um, yeah. Uh, so that's, those are more of the adaptations that I have to make to that, is just, being a little bit more dependent on, on uh, other people, really. I mean, I, I can still be pretty independent, but when it comes down to some of that stuff, you know, haven't quite figured it out yet. The hearing thing, uh, again, is, I don't know if there's a lot of adaptations that I've made for it. I mean, I wear hearing aids. Um, I'm a little harder of hearing than normal right now because I have an ear infection in my left ear, so I'm not wearing the hearing aid in that side. Um, but they definitely, they have awesome hearing aids out there that can help out a lot. They do a lot of cool little tricks and everything. Um, that helped out in a big way. Um, 
And where it becomes problematic is just in a conversation, especially like if we were all talking at once and I'm just trying to talk to say you for a while, it would be really tough to just pick up what you're saying, even if I put it on the setting that's like supposed to focus straight ahead because they pick up sound from all over and they can amplify everything. So you get some headaches from it. It gives other people headaches. There's a lot of times where me and my wife get into arguments and stuff, and it's just because I can't hear what she's saying. And then when she speaks up loud enough for me to say it, I'm like, why are you freaking yelling at me? Yeah. <laughs> like, what did I do to you? But, uh, yeah. So, uh, so that can cause some problems. Uh, something to keep in mind, too. If you have a patient that's been through, like, some sort of a, a blast trauma or anything like that, or, you know, factory, or just has hearing loss and stuff, too, um, tone of voice and the way you say things, like you might be thinking that you're saying it and just loud enough for them to hear and then they're looking at you like, attitude, come on, <laughs> you know, so um, careful with that uh, and just, just know that it can be frustrating for both parties and it might be something you have to work with. Uh, my PTs and OTs did for a long time when I couldn't wear hearing aids because I had, again, I get really bad ear infections because of the, the holes in my eardrum and uh, just the, the type of damage I was done happens pretty easily. Um, so I'd go a lot of time without any hearing aids in and they're really having to like get close and, and speak up and I'm still like, huh, what? And sometimes I'd mess with them and it would really bother them. Uh, <laughs> say something three times, I'm like, huh? Say something again, huh? What? And then they go, seriously? I'm like, I'm just kidding, I heard you the first time and then I'll go do it. <laughs> so look out for that guy. Um, but yeah, uh, that's... I, I, like I said, I don't know if it was as much adaptations with, I mean, they're still ad adapting to the situation, but there's not a whole lot that you can really do, to, aside from like the magnifying glass with the vision thing and the hearing aids with the hearing thing. That was uh, what I found worked for me. I'm sure there's better options too, but uh, like I said, after being in that hospital for two years and having all the bump, like the highs and lows that I had, I was just kind of settling on certain things and just making work and focusing on what I wanted to do afterwards because that was a big part is trying to figure out what I was going to do because I planned on being in the military the rest of my life and uh, that didn't happen and my backup job was uh, was uh, before the military I was a professional arborist so my backup job was hanging off of ropes and cutting down trees and uh, yeah that's not happening either I should have had a better backup job uh, I guess going into the military but whatever. One question, do you have any residual limb pain in your left arm? Um, yes and no. Normally uh, I'll walk around and it'll be fine. Every now and then I'll get some funky tingles and stuff. Uh, I get an itch in my left wrist. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I just sit there sometimes and do this. And people, what are you doing? I'm like scratching my wrist. Like, are you on drugs? What's wrong with you? But, uh, so, uh, but yeah, there will be times uh, um, fortunately, I found that a healthier lifestyle decreased a lot of that. Um, not just the, the movement in general, but a healthier diet significantly uh, increased some of that stuff. But um, there are some workouts that I do where I'm hanging off a pull-up bar for a while. Afterwards, there'll be a little bit of throbbing and some soreness. Uh, a little bit in the joint uh, every now and then, but as far as the nerve pain is concerned, uh, that happens more like it's just certain times of year, certain weather, or if I'm sick or something like that, that that's just something that kind of sticks around. And I've kind of learned to deal with. For the most part, I don't even mention it and stuff. There will, there will be some times. It's been once or twice over the last year that it's like woken me up and I've had to tap her and be like, I need to do something with this. But um, for the most part, it's not too, too bad. When I first, um, for the first six or eight months, it was all the time. And that was one of the things when I, when I had that really good OT, he worked with me a lot. He sat me in a chair and he put a mirror up, and I can't remember exactly how this went. Um, he put a mirror right here, or yeah, anyways, he, put, he set a mirror up basically and had me open and close this hand. But when I was opening and closing this hand and looking at the mirror, I was. Um, I was looking, I was using this arm, I was activating this one as well in the same uh, range of motion and everything. 
and basically with nerve pain, it, it just feels like everything is falling or clenching up in, in one spot, and you feel it, even though the, the limb only goes up here, you feel like your hand is like, you know, like almost like you're digging your fingernails deep in here, or like you're closing so tightly or something like that, or like you're just being crushed. Uh, so the goal is to be able to loosen that up, and I got to a point working with him and working with that mirror trick that he had, where I could literally, well not literally, but I could imagine and I could feel one finger at a time opening up in my my phantom limb you know what I mean and close it up and that would relax it a little bit and get it to pan out a little and that was uh, that was a really important tool that I had because at first uh, like I said I had a sort of a funky amputation I, because of the, the way that that went uh, I had a, a lot of problems with nerve pain at first and he really taught me a good technique to to lessen that so I'm glad that you brought that up because that was an important thing, an important tool that I gained from an occupational therapist while I was there, was being able to relax that, that phantom limb and decrease some of that nerve pain. Now there's other, there's like a bunch of different types of pain that will come with something like that. Like I have some physical joint pain, there's that falling fist nerve pain, and then there's like that electric shock feeling that shoots up every now and then. Um, that usually comes after I whack the limb on something or just uh, after having like a really crap day, like sick or something like that, it'll start shooting pain up. And there's nothing that you can really do with that aside from Medicaid. And I'm not big into that anymore. Because like I said, I had a problem with it while I was in the hospital. So I just try to take a healthier route, get a little bit better food in my system and get some sleep, maybe some Excedrin or something like that, or, or a NyQuil to put me down bottle. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's yeah, the stance I can give on that We have a mirror box in the closet here that some students built. But, and then my last question is, you said you show us your scar on your left knee. Is that still open? An option Will you show us your scar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Show them the one on your back, too. Oh, yeah. That one's pretty impressive. Oh, no. oh, all right, uh, you'll come up here. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so scar on my left knee. I'll see if I can pull this all the way up. I wish I had yeah, more shorts today. See Alright, so this is my left knee, and actually if I could pull it up a little bit further, I can't because of the pant, um, you'd see a big hole right here, and I'm missing a big chunk of my quad as well, down here, uh, so basically the travel came in here and just blew all that out. Wow. This is the left knee, um, this is actually a chunk of my back, I'll show you where it came from in a sec. There's no artificial joint, it's all, it, yeah, over here Brandon. Oh. But your joint is your joint. It's not an artificial yeah, joint. Yeah, the joint is my joint. I managed to get that back together enough, I guess. Uh, and then I just covered it up over. Yeah, oh, um, go up one of the setbacks that I had show. was after that, after the it's knee back. blew out originally, <laughs> um, they did the first flap that they did was a, a gastro flap. They basically cut off one of the heads of my calf and turned it up over. Uh, which is why I only have a third, uh, I'm missing a third of my calf now as well, uh, and that didn't work at all. It was like it, like six hours later, they're like, "Yeah, this this tank, this is dead." It's like awesome, so I'm gonna lose my leg anyways. Oh. All right. um, but uh, then I had a really cool uh, doctor that um, a plastic surgeon that figured out or decided that he wanted to do a fascia flap. Come over here, real quick. They basically take instead of a, a muscle, the next, the next choice was to take one of my, abdom uh, my abdominal walls, and I'm really glad that that didn't happen because this CrossFit thing wouldn't be happening if I was using core strength for that. Uh, but uh, this guy was like, no, 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 before we massacre him up any more than what you idiots already did, let's try this out. Uh, and they did what's called a fascia flap, which is basically uh, along your along your back and your lap you have a layer of skin and fat that has a, uh, a um, not an artery, but a blood line. Because uh, they need they need a blood line to connect up and stuff. So he took a chunk there and slapped that over my knee. It, it wasn't quite doing well at first, which is why they brought the leeches in because the leeches start drawing out all that bad blood and more blood starts pumping through. And next thing you know, started to get a little bit brighter and brighter. After a couple of days of leech therapy and everything, I was good to go. Uh, but the, yeah, this is basically what it looks like where they take something like that from you. So. Cool? Pictures? No, I'm just kidding. You'll look good. So that's, that's there. I used to tell my friends that it was a butt cheek. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 